J.G. Ballard, more than any other writer that I read and enjoy, you seem to me to invent worlds in your books. Where does all this stuff come from? Well, I'm an imaginative writer, obviously, and I think to be, a, to be able to exercise an imagination over a long period of time, as I have done, one's got to be very well stocked in one's childhood with experiences of a pretty radical kind. And I think I was fortunate in my own case that I did have a, an extraordinary childhood. Uh, it, I think if my parents had decided, say, not to go out to China in 1929, and I'd been born in a suburb of Manchester, um, I, I might never have become a writer at all. It's very hard to say. But I think in my, in my own case, the very strange and exhilarating and in some ways very cruel world that Shanghai was um, fed my imagination. I'd like to come back to that later and ask you, since you live in this world, what, is, what, do you, what sort of world do you think we live in? I mean, how is it different from the world in which a 19th century writer wrote in? Well, I think the, the, the main difference is, of course, that we have firstly our, our communications landscape, what I call a media landscape, dominated by uh, television, the international press, by uh, film, uh, which is, and radio, of course, which is, uh, saturates our environment and creates, really, a a kind of two-tier world in which we all live. On the one hand, there's the ordinary world of the streets and the offices and the factories that we move around in. But then there's, a, above this, there's this global umbrella which has now sealed itself around the planet and virtually created a, a, secondary, a secondary reality. And there's constant leakage between the two. Uh, I mean, I could almost say that you know, media landscape of the present day is a sort of a map in search of a territory. I mean, the, the, the great television companies of the world, great news organizations, are constantly hunting about, trying to find something in ordinary, everyday reality which will match their expectations. And they, they tend to latch on to great disasters or confrontations of any kind and magnify them enormously, whether it's... How do you use this secondary world in your books? Do you describe it or are you predicting changes in it or are you, are you using it as your subject matter in some way? I think I, I do both because I began as a science fiction writer and I think all science fiction writers have a sort of cautionary streak in their natures. Um, they're rather like volunteer road sign painters. Um, you know, people accuse, have accused me and accused most science fiction writers of being rather pessimistic because they're always warning of dangers ahead. But I think if you, you know, a sign painter who puts, paints a sign saying dangerous bends ahead, slow down, isn't a pessimist. I mean, he's merely giving a, an accurate warning of, you know... You don't think you're writing dangerous bends ahead, speed up? That's a, yes. Of course, I am, actually, in some of, in some of my books. I mean, paradoxically, Crash is, is a dangerous bends ahead, speed up book. Uh, but that's because I feel that there are a lot of ambiguities in the modern communications landscape, which reflect ambiguities in our own natures, and that these need to be explored. And we too easily assume that violence is bad for us, say, on our television screens, that... Um, you think it's good for us? I think the truth is good for us. And I think that attempts to, to suppress, say, all violent imagery uh, are doomed to failure. I mean, there is a violent streak in human nature and the human imagination. The sexual imagination is a, a limitless fund of wayward 
metaphors and ideas. One can't repress that either. So in a book like Crash, which, which uses um, car accidents and fatalities in car accidents as a sort of sexual or sexually provoking imagery, um, you're saying that it's a good thing, apart from the readability of the book uh, and, the, and people's enjoyment of it, you're saying it's a good thing to be able to take these horrors, automobiles plowing into our flesh, and give them some sort of... Um, and put them where we can live with them. Yes, I think our ambivalent feelings about events like car crashes or disasters in everyday life should be brought out into the open. You mean we actually people, want people, these things to happen? No, we're, no, we're not excited by... I mean, we're not uh, sexually excited by car crashes, um, obviously, but... People are drawn to disasters. They don't enjoy uh, violence on their TV screens or in their films, but they are drawn to them because I think they feel that the sort of secret formulas of our lives are in some way revealed in these tragic events. And there's nothing necessarily ghoulish about it. Uh, and I think it's a mistake to try to suppress th that ambiguous response that we all feel. And, I mean, a crash is a kind of extreme hypothesis about the dangers that modern technology have created. They've allowed us, perhaps, to play with our own, I'm thinking particularly of, of television and videos and home video systems and, and our, our accessibility to a, an enormous range of, of violent imagery in the world around us, which is fed into our homes constantly. Uh, people have this enormous access, and I think we, we've got to see what... We've got to immerse ourselves in the most destructive element, as Conrad said, and see if we can swim. And the most destructive element, of course, is ourselves. Modern technology has created the possibilities for our own psychopathologies to play with almost unrestricted freedom. That could be extremely dangerous, but it's worth exploring. But does it turn us, could it turn some of us into dangerously nasty people? Is that what you're suggesting? No, I think they already are dangerous. Those are already are dangerously nasty. I mean, one must remember that, you know, within a, a, a thousand miles of where we're sitting now, or not much more, say two, a two-day drive from here, this century, tens of millions of people have been killed, millions of them put to death in the most cruel way. Well, let's now, that you can't attribute that simply to sort of the vagaries of sure history so. or to the behavior of a small gang of, you know, political psychopaths. These elements lie in human nature, and perhaps modern technology is, is bringing them out and is facilitating them in a dangerous way. Crash is an example of a, an attempt to understand what may be going on, using the car crash as a sort of central metaphor. Let's go back to your childhood in, in a China which was s subject to the violence of, of invasion uh, and massacre, um, like what you're talking about in Europe. T um, what are the images that stick with you of that? Well, from a very early age, I was born in 1930, I remember Shanghai vividly as an as a huge, exhilarating, but brutal city. Uh, millions of Chinese flocked there in the 1930s from the outlying country side where famine was rife, civil war was rife. And of course there was no, absolutely no social security of any kind. If you, if you fainted of, from hunger and fell to the pavements of Shanghai, which must have been the hardest pavements in the world, you lay there and died. And I mean, it was quite common when I went to school in the morning um, to see uh, the bodies of dead people lying by the roadside or the coffins of small children uh, and adults placed by the roadside. Um, trucks would drive around Shanghai every day uh, collecting the bodies of people who died overnight and uh, it was a, a cruel and brutal place. I, I, there's certainly no doubt about that. I mean, it was a place where anything went. Um, at the same time, it had the tremendous freedom for the imagination to soar. And I was uh, you know, amazed by the ingenuity and brilliance of the Chinese in there, in all the sort of 
fantastic um, advertising displays they put on, processions did, and all the rest of it. In this vast landscape, did your parents loom large or were they hardly there? Um, were you much on a, your own? Yes, I was on my own. A, a fair, my sister was seven years younger than me, so to all intents and purposes, for a long while, I was an only child. My parents had a very busy social life. I won't say I never saw them, that's not true. I, I remember my mother regularly helping me almost every day with my homework and so on. I probably didn't see as much of my father uh, as I did of her, but... Uh, did you feel on your own? I was on my own a lot. Though, I mean, alone with a house with, in a house with about nine servants, um, with constant fear of, of kidnapping, so I was never allowed officially to go out by myself. So, in fact, I would pretend to go and visit a friend round the corner and then set off on my bike and, at the age of about eight or nine, pedal all over Shanghai. And the most in I'm amazed that I'm still here. I would never have allowed my own children to ride around Shepparton <laughs> in that way. Um, but I mean, I wasn't a solitary child, sort of. Yeah. What were your first impressions of England when you came here? It was, it was, a, it was quite a shock, actually, because I'd, be, I'd been... A shock I don't think I'd fully recovered from. I, I'd been brought up to think of England as a land of rolling meadows and village greens and uh, occupied almost entirely by a middle class living in you know, only slightly scaled down versions of Hampton Court Palace. And I arrived here and found this small, gray, tired little island, very dark, where it drizzled perpetually, um, full of, I mean, full of working class people whom I'd never met before, who were very badly treated, poorly housed and poorly educated, and with a comparatively small middle class who really had lost their confidence, I think, and uh, yet defended themselves behind a labyrinth of social codes and practices that you needed to be a skilled anthropologist to decipher. And I, I, you were seeing England as a foreigner, as a visitor. Yes, I was, for, yeah. for a long while. And I, I, I think that, um, particularly when I realized that I would never go back to China because in 1949, only three years later, Mao and the communists took mm. over the country and uh, the, the curtain came down for about 30 years. I realized I had to make my, a new life in this strange, complicated realm. And, um, but I've always remained a bit of an outsider. There's no question about that. You read medicine at uh, Cambridge University. Why did you choose medicine? I wanted to become a psychiatrist, which was a bit of an adolescent ambition, which of course many psychiatrists fulfill. Uh, I think it was a case of sort of physician cure thyself. But, uh, but also, I think, I, I was very, when I was at school, I, came, I, I was at school here for a couple of years, and I discovered Freud and began to read psychoanalysis every hour of the day and night. And I think, in, I, I think I saw England as really a subject for, for psychoanalysis, that this was, a sort of, this country needed to be, I mean, it really needed to be laid out on the couch and uh, examined closely. Obviously, deep traumas lay in its past, which had to be summoned to the surface in some sort of way. Why did you stop medicine? I think the pressure to become a writer was just too great. Also, I'd completed the preclinical phase, and I knew then that I would be walking the wards as a trainee houseman, and that I would have no time to write probably for years. Did you get anything from the study of medicine? Yes, sir. Oh, I did. Yes, I mean, it, it's, it supplied me with a anatomy? huge... Dissection? Anatomy? Dissection? Anatomy in particular. There was something about the dissection of, of the human cadaver, bearing in mind in particular that most of the cadavers in the dissecting room then, and probably still now, were donated by doctors before their deaths. And there was something rather moving about the dedication of these men who are about to die or looking ahead to their own deaths and deciding to, to bestow their bodies on the next generation of doctors. I found that very, uh, uh, a, sort of a great testimony to the spirit of these, these dead men. And then one, as one dissected them, they, one embarked on a strange sort of voyage into the interior, and obviously in a literal way, but also 
into a rich um, sort of undergrowth of metaphors and images and possibilities that the human body represents. Which and you've used. I've in used in a, not only anatomy, of course, but also physiology, which is, again, rich in, in imagery that sort of reveals the secret formulas of what make up a, a human being. How did you decide that you could be a full-time writer? How did you come to that? That happened my, rather, later on. It wasn't until I was about 30 that and I'd been writing short stories for four or five years, um, which I fortunately was able to do as a science fiction writer uh, because there was a limitless demand by the, by the magazines. And I published my first novel, The Drowned World, which was, had a small success, and I knew this was the time to make the break. You better go back a bit before that and tell me why you decided to write science fiction. Well, in, I started writing in, the, in, I think, the late 50s, in about 1956, 57. And by then, I was aware of the enormous changes that were coming over England and Western Europe. The, the, the blueprint for the societies, for the, for the world which we inhabit now, was being laid down in the world of consumer goods, of package holidays, jet travel, high-rises, motorways, computers. There were the first hints of space travel was around the corner. Change was in the air, and it seemed to me that the English novel of the day, which was the realist novel of, in their different ways, Kingsley Amis, Anthony Powell, C.P. Snow, L.P. Hartley, didn't reflect these changes in any way whatever, they were concerned. I mean, Lucky Jim was a great deal of fun, but it wasn't really about the world I was living in and the rest of people, the rest, everyone else in England uh, were living in. It was a rather provincial little world. And that was true of so much of English realistic fiction. I wanted a larger, a larger sort of continent that I could begin to you know, set foot on. And particularly as these changes that I Take saw Take the novel out of England and out of this time and place. Yes, but more of a, it wasn't just England, but the fact, because England was changing, and it, it was being changed to a large extent by science and technology. Uh, the first motorways, you know, the first, a TV, of course. This was a vital ingredient in, in change. Um, it was being changed by, by by science and technology, which were completely absent from the work of almost all English novelists of the day. Was there anything? Whereas science fiction, here was this sort of untouched continent of possibilities, um, which it's, itself by then had become rather provincial and was desperately in need of renewal. So I thought, here goes. What about surrealism? Where did you bump into that? Again, I think. It, when I was at school in England, I, I was lucky that the school I went to was in Cambridge itself. So I was able to go to art galleries there. And I think I began to see in the late 40s, before I went to the university itself, uh, exhibitions of paintings by the Surrealists. And they tapped something that had been very, very important in my imagination, because in many ways I am, I suppose, a Surrealist writer. Um, they showed how the imagination could remake the world and remake it, moreover, in a way which revealed its secret nature. And I think it, surrealist painters, Dali, whom I've always admired, um, Ernst and Magritte and the others, reminded me too in a curious way of, of, of my childhood in Shanghai. I re that so Shanghai was, in many ways, a surrealist city, and that science fiction, which had close affinities with, with surrealism, surrealism, was a way in which I could use the techniques of surrealism to remake the landscape of 1950s and 1960s England into something that, in a way, resembled the Shanghai I'd left behind. The landscapes you invent seem to me to be very powerful and, and very imaginative indeed. Um, but there's a simplicity in a way, um, some have suggested, about 
the human relationships in, in your writing and in your sort of writing, really. Is, is that something that one loses if one abandons the naturalistic tradition of novel writing, abandons, uh, loses the complexity of human relationships? I think that's true, because I think the imaginative writer, and to some extent the science fiction writer, and we see this in the greatest science fiction writers like Orwell and uh, Huxley in... in uh, Brave New World and Wells, isn't concerned with characterization. He's concerned, I mean, I feel this about myself, I'm much more concerned with psychological roles. The people who appear in my fiction have an affinity with the sort of people you find in case histories. You know, I mean, Mrs. F got onto a train in Guildford and found she was sitting in the carriage next to God, and God told her to go out and sweep the streets of Guildford. The you know, following day, she bought a broom. Uh, this is a case history. Now, we're not, what is important is the this psychological phenomenon of this woman, not you know, what her tastes in uh, petit fours are, right. or, or what all, she's her, to... all her little relationships with her cousins and her aunts. Right. What uh, feeds your imagination now? What do you read? I'm afraid mostly non-fiction. What sort of non-fiction? Um, well, by coincidence, I've just finished Peter Gay's biography of Freud, a, re a remarkable work. Uh, I'm now reading a, another biography of Lotolania and uh, a book by the chief stylist of Mercedes-Benz on the psychology of automobile design. <laughs> <laughs> so a bit, I'm a bit of a magpie, but... Uh, I think pretty well everything is grist to my Do you get information from printouts and yes. journals and I mean, do you not read as, railway timetables? Not, as many, airline as, time? not as many, sadly, as I used to. I, uh, an old friend of mine, Dr. Christopher Evans at the National Physical Laboratory, until his death, literally sent me every week the contents of his waste paper basket, which I devoured. It was full of, of, of pharmaceutical company handouts, specialist journals, um, ex ex extraordinary material, which most writers, most science fiction writers, never have access to. And access is a big problem. One just isn't, a, there's this paradox of a world in which modern communications have triumphed. I mean, data move around the globe at the speed of an electron, and yet one has access to less and less. I've known writers who complained to me that they would be, we would all be swamped under great piles of paper information. You seem to rather welcome the prospect and well, wish there was no limit to what you could know. It's a, yes, I do. I mean, I'd love to know everything that I could. I would like to have the equivalent of a ticker tape. Maybe, I dare say one day this will happen. Spinning, you know, spilling out information of every kind of the latest automobile varnishes, what everybody in a, the seven, later, you know, the seven four seven on the way to Miami had for breakfast, um, you know, the program of the, the Royal Opera House for the next ten years, everything, uh, because this is this stimulates the imagination and it it's, uh, a, it's it's an age of information. Is it an age of space? Is it a space age? Are we living in a space age? Sadly, I think the space age has ended. Why do you think that? Well, I think it's a... I mean, I think to... I remember hearing in 1957 the BBC broadcast of the call sign of Sputnik 1, which was a real call to arms. I mean, it was a, a signal from another world. This was the future dialing itself into us. And everyone then expected, particularly when Gagarin went into space and later when the Americans landed on the moon in 1969, that the space age would run on forever. But in fact, I don't think it happened. I think public interest be soon after began to wane. And I think the far from lasting hundreds of years, the space age ran for less than 20 from 1957, Sputnik 1, to 1975, which was the first Apollo splashdown not to be shown on TV by the American networks because they knew the public was bored. And what even more surprising, which startled me, was that it produced no spin-off. I can remember the 1930s when all the great um, record-breaking attempts, the fastest plane, the fastest train, the deepest descent into the oceans, the highest balloon, all these had a tremendous 
gave a tremendous charge to ordinary life. I mean, the spin-off in architecture and design of domestic interiors. I mean, everything was streamlined. Even static objects like teapots were streamlined. Now, none of that happened as a consequence of the the American space and Russian space program. Now, maybe another race to Mars will start it up again. What about inner space? It sounds from what you're saying as if you think that one has a long way to go. Yes, I think so. I think that's rather a larger area and uh, um, far more complicated. And is, is, after all, where we... I mean, it's the inside of our heads which shape our sense of ourselves and, and, and the universe. And it's, it, it's an interior that we... I mean, we can, map the, we can map every square inch of the moon or Mars, and no doubt will do, but the inside of our heads is a very different proposition. It's the role of your fiction to invent. Can you go, can you go on and on inventing in the extraordinary way that you do? I'm not... I haven't. Does switching into, as you did with Empire of the Sun, into a sort of more autobiographical novel, do that provide a bit of respite? Curiously enough... Or was that invented too? No. No, it wasn't. I mean, it's semi-autobiographical, and by and large, the picture that I describe is, is as accurate as I remember it, though I reshaped individual incidents, of course. But the general picture of Shanghai and the war is as I remember it, and is borne out by newsreels at the time. Um, that was a realistic novel, but of a very heightened kind. Yes. And Will there be more? I, I, I feel... Uh, Will, will I follow that up? Yes, I'm working now on... I think I'll, my next book will be a follow-up to Empire of the Sun, tracing what happened when I returned to England. Can you go on inventing more other worlds beyond that, do you think? It's not a matter of inventing uh, a completely self-contained world, because most of my novels of, say, the 70s crash high-rise, which about high-rise building, concrete island, about a man marooned on a traffic island, are all set in the here and now. Right. They're not strictly speaking science, well, they're not science fiction at all, really. Um, but they look at the opportunities that modern technology offers for us to play games with our, you know, our own sort of psychopathologies. It's... What I do is enlist the imagination and, and try to place it at the service of what I see as, you know, the half visible uh, that lies, you know, that area that lies in the back back of our heads that needs to be lit up. Um, I don't think invention plays as big a part really in my fiction as it appears to at first sight. Some 600 former internees, mostly women and children, sailed for England in a converted meat carrier. My father and the other Britons staying behind in Shanghai stood on the pier at Hong Kiu waving to us as the Arawa drew away from them across the slow brown tide. When we reached the middle of the channel, working our way through scores of American destroyers and landing craft, I left my mother and walked to the stern of the ship the relatives on the pier were still waving to us, and my father saw me and raised his arm. But I found it impossible to wave back to him, something I regretted for many years. Perhaps I blamed him for sending me away from this mysterious and exhilarating city. Many people have said to me, what an extraordinary life you've had. Of course, my childhood in Shanghai 
was far closer to the way the majority of people on this planet in previous centuries and in the 20th century have lived than, say, the life in Western Europe and the United States. It's we here in our quiet suburbs and our comparatively peaceful cities who are the anomalies. J.G. Ballard's novel, Empire of the Sun, about a boy adrift in war-torn Shanghai, is one of the finest English novels to come out of the Second World War. In that book, Ballard, previously known for his science fiction, addressed his own life on the mysterious sources of his writing. On the day he publishes the sequel to Empire of the Sun, a highly personal book called The Kindness of Women, Bookmark takes Ballard back to Shanghai for the first time in 45 years. I describe Empire of the Sun and the Kindness of Women as semi-autobiographical, which they are. I mean, many of the events that took place are straightforward transcriptions of what actually happened to me. My first intact memories really date from 1937, when the Japanese invaded China and all of Shanghai, except for the international settlement. And there was tremendously bitter fighting in and around the city. I don't ever remember being frightened. I think it was because we lived very protected lives as the children of Westerners in Shanghai. If I was moving around the city, as it were, officially, I travelled everywhere in my parents' car with a chauffeur. And unofficially, of course, I was always pretending to go and see a friend who lived in Amherst Avenue. And I'd ride on my little bike I'd ride all over Shanghai in the most extraordinary way. I don't know whether it was the sort of magic of childhood that gave me safe passage, or a sort of built-in arrogance of a Westerner who took for granted that he wouldn't be harmed. To understand the fighting that followed, we must know something about the city of Shanghai itself. Situated near the mouth of the Yangtze River, it is the biggest city in China. As the largest seaport in the Far East, it dominated the commerce and foreign trade of China. And through its great docks and channels passed most of the wealth of the Orient. In Shanghai, truly the East met the West. entering Shanghai. To my child's eyes, which had seen nothing else, Shanghai was a waking dream where everything I could imagine had already been taken to its extreme. The garish billboards and nightclub neon signs, the young Chinese gangsters and violent beggars were part of an overlit realm more exhilarating than the American comics and radio serials I so adored. My father called Shanghai the most advanced city in the world. This is 31 Amherst Avenue, as was the house in Shanghai where I spent my childhood. Coming back to Shanghai for the first time since 1946 has been a very strange experience. And of course, the house is the strangest of all. It's because I 
I spent my entire childhood here, and I really came to something close to adult life here. So it is a strange, um, it is a strange experience. Um, I mean, I can't keep trying to think what would have happened had the war not taken place. I would have gone on living here and probably would have gone on living in Shanghai. So I have a kind of, I see around me here, a sort of alternate life that I never actually managed to live because of the war. Time had stopped in Amherst Avenue, as motionless as the wall of dust that hung across the rooms, briefly folding itself around Jim as he walked through the deserted house. Almost forgotten scents, a faint taste of carpet, reminded him of the period before the war. For three days, he waited for his mother and father to return. Every morning, he climbed onto the sloping roof above his bedroom window and gazed over the residential streets in the western suburbs of Shanghai. He watched the columns of Japanese tanks move into the city. It was very strange walking into, into my old bedroom on the top floor of the house because that still has its original blue paintwork. And I recognized the little bookshelves uh, where I kept my books, my copies of Chum's Annual and Boy's Own Paper and all my American comics, and the bathroom attached to it. Um, it, 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 it. It was like a sort of time capsule, really, that I'd stepped into after all these years. So much of ordinary life today I mean, is driven by the most peculiar psychological forces. And in the case of my own fiction, there is an attempt as well to try to understand the sort of changed nature of fiction and reality that constitutes our, our world. Of all the places of wonder, the Great World Amusement Park on the Avenue Edward VII most amazed me. It contained the magic heart of Shanghai within its six floors. A vast warehouse of light and noise. The amusement park was filled with magicians and fireworks, slot machines and sing-song girls. A haze of frying fat gleamed in the air and formed a greasy film on my face, mingling with the smell of joss sticks and incense. Stunned by the din, I would follow Yang as he slipped through the acrobats and Chinese actors striking their gongs. All my characters spend their time constructing personal mythologies which can sustain their inner lives. My characters tend to be solitary. I think this is true. They don't actually look like the dead. They look like visitors from another planet. As you begin the process of dissection, you enter literally and mentally and imaginatively into the bodies of these dead men and women. I mean, as you separate nerves and blood vessels and dissect muscles away from the bones, you are getting as close to another human being in the physical sense, and to some extent the imaginative sense, you, you can ever do. And I think it's a, a, an enriching and powerful experience. Dissection is a kind of erotic autopsy. I imagine the strange act of love performed by an obsessed surgeon on a living woman in a deserted operating theatre in one of those sinister clinics in the Cambridge suburbs. I would kiss the linings of her lungs, run my tongue along her bronchi, press my face to the moist membranes of her heart as it pulsed against my lips. It seemed to me that 
it, by dissecting the body, by understanding how all its various biological systems function. You were getting to some sort of basic truth about human beings, because the brain lay beyond, but um, at least it was a start. And so, so particularly as the, the, the human body was surrounded with so many taboos, and still is, and of course in 1951 was surrounded by infinitely more taboos than it is now, it, it, it seemed to be a, a start and but after two years I'd had enough and I I still hadn't found myself in England, which I found a, which seemed to me a very, very strange place. So I for a few years I embarked on a kind of um catch as catch can existence working for an advertising agency for a brief while. I went to Canada with the RAF as a trainee pilot for a while. I'd had enough of the Air Force. Flying had been interesting, and it had given me another set of myths to live by, all of which, I, I, oddly enough, I fed into my fiction. Flying has always been a very important part of my fiction. I think it stems from my childhood, and in particular, the air war over Shanghai. I think this first sight of the American B-29s began to bomb Shanghai in 1944. And then the fighter attacks by Mustangs that flew so low over Long Lock Camp that I remember looking down at them from the second and third floor of buildings during the air raids. I mean, they were flying within 10 feet of the paddy fields. I mean, I accept the sort of idea that flight is a sort of Symbol of escape, but I think more more than escape of transcendence. Um, it's played a very large role in, in my fiction. My characters are forever dreaming of runways and looking into the those skies where they can transcend themselves, and from which, of course, in the mid and late twentieth century, life and death come in terms of nuclear weapons. I think I was assembling a kind of mythology for myself, um, a kind of substitute. I'd, 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 I'd deliberately forgotten my, my China background by then. I never mentioned it to anybody. My wife, when I married her in 1954 or 55, um, I don't think I ever told her that I was born and brought up in Shanghai, or if I did, it was only in passing, and I hardly ever described it to my children. The past had slipped away, taking with it my memories of Cambridge, of the dissecting room, and even Shanghai. The warm light over Shepparton reminded me of the illuminated air that I'd seen over the empty paddy fields of Lunghua as I walked along the railway line. But the light that filled the splash meadow came from a kinder and more gentle sun. The children who played by the stream had taken the place of the dead Chinese lying in the Lunghua creeks and canals. For the first time, I was living in an endless present that owed nothing to the past. We came here, my wife and I, in 1960. We had three very young children and we were looking for a house. Um, where we could bring them up, really, in a, in a sort of quiet suburb. So we, we, we saw that a house was advertised here and had a look around Shepton and found that in many ways it was a sort of tranquil and quite mysterious place. The river, which winds through Shepton like a sort of great snake. All the gravel lakes here and the, and the great reservoirs of the Metropolitan Water Board together make you realise when you fly from Heathrow and look down on the place that this is a marine world. And I think it was a right choice at the time because Shepparton has sort of insinuated itself into my fiction over the years. I'd arrived in Vermilion Sands three months earlier. 
Driving into the desert one day, I stopped near the coral towers on the highway to Lagoon West. As I gazed at these immense pagodas stranded on the floor of this fossil sea, I heard music coming from a sand reef 200 yards away, where sonic statues had run to seed beside a ruined studio. The owner had gone, abandoning the hangar-like building to the sand rays and the desert. When I started reading science fiction for the first time in 1954, and I was unusual in that I started writing it at almost the same time, science fiction, I think, was dominated by its sociological speculation. Uh, it, was, it was really interested in, in the present rather than the very far future. And it struck me that science fiction had the right vocabulary with which to explore the world in which we found ourselves living in the mid-1950s. It seemed to me that a new kind of Britain was emerging. The first motorways, you know, the, and above all, I think, the TV landscape that was being imposed on all this. I mean, all the great issues of the day at that time the threat of nuclear war, the development of modern communication systems, in particular television, the role that computers were going to play, the transformation of the whole planet into a media landscape, the changing nature of fiction and reality within that media landscape. All these were topics that were not covered in any way by, say, the English mainstream novel of the day. It, it struck me that here was an interesting field that was ripe for, ripe for takeover, I felt. The first artificial Earth satellite in the world. In this overlit realm, ruled by images of the space race and the Vietnam War, the Kennedy assassination and the suicide of Marilyn Monroe, a unique alchemy of the imagination was taking place. The brutalizing newsreels of civil wars and assassinations the stylization of televised violence into an anthology of design statements were matched by a pornography of science that took its materials not from nature but from the deviant curiosity of the scientist. Across Asia, Africa and South America controlling the pitch and roll of the ship. After I got married, the children began to appear. I needed some kind of much more settled life so that I could write in the evenings and the weekends. So I took a job on a chemical society journal called Chemistry and Industry, which was a weekly scientific journal. I, I was assistant editor of it. It was a good place to work because, of course, the office of any scientific magazine is the most wonderful mail drop the ultimate sort of information crossroads. Most of it went straight into the waste paper basket, but en route, I was sort of, I was sort of filtering it like some sort of sea creature, you know, sailing with its jaws open through a great sea of delicious plankton. I, I mean, I was filtering all this extraordinary material. I certainly remember reading with great interest the first... I certainly remember reading with great interest, the first scientific papers on the chemistry of hallucinogenic drugs. That was very interesting to me. In The Kindness of Women, I describe the central character, an arator, Jim, taking LSD, as I did myself at about the same time in this house. Something we all had to do, I think, in the mid-60s. It was a piece of real foolishness on my part. But I, I wasn't expecting the sort of total sort of derailment of my mind that LSD brought about. They were soon within the body of the forest and had entered an enchanted world. The crystal trees around them were hung with glass like trellises of moss. The long arc of trees hanging over the water seemed to drip and glitter like myriads of prisms, the trunks and branches sheathed by bars of yellow and carmine light that bled away across the surface of the water, as if the whole scene were being reproduced by some overactive technicolor process. 
the entire length of the opposite shore glittered with this blurred kaleidoscope. Domestic life and family life provided the background to the sort of, to, to what must seem to outsiders a very strange group of, of novels. But I think that background of domesticity and all of the excitement of young children is the anchor pinning my imagination to the, to the real world. I think part of Daddy's writing is all about how normal everything looks, but actually under the surface, it's not at all normal. I remember him doing the odd, uh, the odd strange thing. Like, I remember he sprayed his shoes silver, silver paint, one day, and then strolled around Shepperton, and Shepperton being a very kind of bourgeois, boring town. You know, all the local residents, you could imagine, were, were looking and thinking, how weird. Mm. And when it was even... When it was hot... Um, I remember Daddy once stripping off and walking around the garden naked, <laughs> which he thought was quite normal. But, of course, the neighbours all started looking and thinking, gosh, you know, who's that crazy guy next door? And I'm very glad that I was able to bring up the children myself. And I, mean, I often say that, in fact, they brought me up. I mean, I, I became... In fact, I had a kind... I imagine I had a kind of second childhood. I re... I was able to relive my own lost childhood through them. I remember one particular um, point, which was he obviously remembered the very, very bright light in Shanghai because even on a really hot, beautiful summer day, he would have all the electric lights on in the house. And I sometimes used to say, we don't need the light on. He said, oh, yes, we do. It's got to be brighter. In fact, my wife caught pneumonia and died in Spain in a matter of hours, tragically. Um, it certainly was sudden. I mean, it was certainly something that no, I mean, no young father or young mother, for that matter, uh, with two or three children expects the spouse to suddenly die without any warning. I mean, I, I felt at the time that you know, nature had committed a terrible crime against my wife and my children. I mean, it... I think the death of my wife provided me with a sort of... a sort of renewed impetus to... to make sense of the... again, to make sense of the sort of arbitrary cruelty of the world. A gentle conspiracy existed among my friends and publishing acquaintances as they feigned not to notice that Miriam had vanished through a window of time and space. This silence reminded me of the cruel childhood game in which we pretended, without telling him, that one of our friends no longer existed. The poor victim would be ignored, stared through, excluded from any games. Watching the national mourning of a stricken America after the assassination of President Kennedy, I almost envied his bereaved wife. Every moment of her grief was endlessly replayed and anatomized on television. Her husband's death, like the murder of his assassin, was recapitulated in slow motion, frame by numbered Zapruder frame. Now the world hears the appalling news. President Kennedy is dead. In a bronze coffin, his body arrived at the airport. Mrs. Kennedy, in a dress stained with her husband's blood, rides in the ambulance. Automatically, Mr. Lyndon Johnson... She wore her blood-spattered skirt, like a scream of rage at the world that had widowed her. I think it's true that a lot of the sort of machine-like alienated sex that takes place in books like Crash or High Rise is a reflection of you know, my own sort of despair um, after the death of my wife and 
and the sort of peculiar, uh, sort of affectless quality that life in the late 60s began to have when I think it all began to, f- to come apart at the seams. Yes, yes. Each afternoon, she would take me into the garden of the trailer park. Undressing herself, she made me memorize the trajectories of her body. After Freud's exploration within the psyche, it is now the outer world of reality which must be quantified and eroticized. Fiction is a branch of neurology. The scenarios of nerve and blood vessel are the written mythologies of memory and desire. Sensation ruled the late 60s. Nothing mattered unless it... I mean, it was like... you know, firing an electric current into the leg of a a dead frog. All you were looking for was a sort of larger and larger kick. And this kick could be provided by drugs or, or, or films of car crashes or... Or, or pure sensation transmitted through television. I mean, the people worried about the sort of violence that's shown on television now obviously have forgotten the sort of commonplace scenes of uh, dreadful violence that were shown on, on British television during the say, Civil War and the Congo and the Vietnam War. And all this had a sort of deadening of the emotions. And, and it seemed to me that one needed to perhaps embrace this world to see what would happen, immerse oneself in the, dis- in the most destructive element, in Conrad's words, to, and, 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 and see if one could swim in this new realm. I discovered the true significance of the automobile crash, the meaning of whiplash injuries and rollover the ecstasies of head-on collisions. Together, we visited the Road Research Laboratory, 20 miles to the west of London, and watched the calibrated vehicles crashing into the concrete target blocks. Later, in his apartment, Vaughan screened slow-motion films of test collisions that he'd photographed with his cine camera. Sitting in the darkness, we watched the silent impacts flicker. The repeated sequences of crashing cars first calmed and then aroused me. Cruising alone on the motorway, I thought of myself at the controls of these impacting vehicles. In my early fiction, I was always much more interested in psychological roles than in 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 what we conventionally think of as sort of novelistic characterization. Um, because I was always interested in, in s- sort of psychiatric case histories. They they seem to me to be closer to the truth. Psychoanalysis meets science fiction now on BBC Four in a profile of J.G. Ballard. Very serious accident there, an overturned lorry and up to 20 other vehicles involved. There's also a nasty accident reported on the M3 northbound. About eight cars are involved. To the west of London, there's another collision blocking two lanes of the southbound M4 Heathrow Spur Road. Inspiring isn't exactly the first word you think of when you look at these bland landscapes and ring roads and flyovers and industrial estates. Blight is more likely. But for the British writer J.G. Ballard, this suburban sprawl is as provocative in its way as Tahiti was for Gauguin or Dublin for James Joyce. This, believe it or not, is a land of dreams. 
nightmares might be closer to the truth, actually, because for 40 years in his novels and short stories, J.G. Ballard has delighted in imagining the very worst that could happen, global catastrophe and mass psychosis. This tireless pathologist of the modern condition has published 60 novels and nearly 100 short stories. He's ranged from fantasies of environmental apocalypse in books like The Drowned World and The Drought to jarring collisions between human desire and high technology in novels like Crash. And more recently, Ballard has turned his uncannily prescient eye on the dangers of high security, the world of business parks and gated communities where conscience is contracted out to the security cameras. You could call what he writes science fiction, I suppose, but then what other science fictions are as down to earth in their settings? You could also call it fantasy, but what other fantasies have proved as prophetic about the real world? Whatever label you want to stick on him, it's clear, I think, that J.G. Ballard is a writer who wants to peel away the surfaces of the world, not just record them. And, true to form, Ballard has chosen a characteristically bleak location for our meeting, a vast reservoir in Shepperton, which lies beneath Heathrow flight path. Hi. Hello, Tom. Good to see you. Good to meet you. I feel I've come onto your territory here. Well, this I is... suppose it is. I, I've lived here. Shepparton, which is just the other side of the reservoir, for about 40 years, and I, I feel it's sort of more my kind of terrain. You know, this world of all reservoirs and marinas, science parks and industrial estates. It's an airport culture. It's the world of the CCTV camera. I feel that this is the real England. I came to Shepparton in 1960. I used to walk around and look up at the embankments of these huge reservoirs and I, I realized we were, I was living at this, on the floor of a sort of invisible marine landscape and I'd, I'd published quite a few short stories by then but I hadn't written a novel. The last novel I wrote was The Drowned World which described in England well, after the ice caps had melted sort of inundated with water. This is the air, beautiful prayer. The sun was still hidden behind the vegetation on the eastern side of the lagoon, but the mounting heat was bringing the huge predatory insects out of their lairs all over the moss-covered surface of the hotel. In the early morning light, a strange mournful beauty hung over the lagoon. The somber green-black fronds of the gymnosperms, intruders from the Triassic past, and the half-submerged white-faced buildings of the 20th century reflected together in the dark mirror of the water, the two interlocking worlds apparently suspended at some junction in time. The drowned world was an apocalyptic vision. Why do you think the went in that direction, towards catastrophe. The English have always written disaster fiction. I think it may be something to do with the climate. It may be something to do with being cooped up in, in what is a sort of glorified lifeboat moored in the North Sea. Um, and, you know, if you're all going to survive in a lifeboat, you've got to be pretty self-disciplined. And well, as a result, the English are a bit repressed and destroying the lifeboat or destroying England by some natural cataclysm is one way of sort of breaking free of, 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 of all this repression. He lay back thinking of the events of the past years that had launched him on his neuronic odyssey. He left the lagoon and entered the jungle again, following it southwards through the increasing rain and heat. A second Adam, searching for the forgotten paradises of the reborn sun.
It's a curious kind of disaster, isn't it? Because there's half a sense that there are delightful new possibilities, that this, the, the end of one world creates another one. Do you always kind of welcome the idea of things breaking down a bit? Yes, in order to sort of re-mythologize yourself, recharge your imaginative batteries and, and discover, you know, sort of some sort of latent, some hidden truth about yourself. I mean, all central characters behave in a paradoxical way. They embrace the, the cataclysm because they're, they're seeking some sort of psychological truth about themselves. I mean, the, these are stories of psychological fulfillment in many ways. You know, the characters are, are finding a sort of, you know, the, the real, so-called real world isn't convincing anymore. When catastrophe it, it came along for you, it was at a much, much more domestic level, of course. I mean, your world did change and, and your wife died. What kind of happened then and what happened to your writing? Well, it was, it was a great you know, tragedy for her and for my three very young children and for me. I think it certainly, I mean, it completely changed my life. I mean, being a writer, was very important to me because I had to make a living to support my family and hold everything together. But uh, I think I was just relying on my sort of unconscious reflexes. Many people have said that my writing grew a lot darker uh, from the mid 60s onwards. I started writing the pieces that made up the atrocity exhibition, which was a you know, which looks at sort of violence and sensationalism. You know, in the media landscape of, in, particularly in America, post the assassination of Kennedy. Catherine Austin unlocked the door and followed Travers into the deserted laboratory. Ignoring her, Travers walked towards the display screens. Disquieting diorama of pain and mutilation, strange sexual wounds, imaginary Vietnam atrocities. Until Nathan ordered the experiment to end, it had been a daily nightmare for her, a sick game which the volunteers had increasingly enjoyed. Why was Travers obsessed by these images? Their own sexual relationship was marked by a most seraphic tenderness, transits of touch and feeling as serene as the movements of a dune. It seemed to be an, an era of inexplicable deaths, the murder of Kennedy. Um, the threat, you know, of nuclear war was still very great. Vietnam was, was really getting into full swing. I mean, nightly atrocities were shown on television. Um, murder and death seemed to be in the air, and all kinds of electrified by this new medium of, of TV. In his next novel, Crash, Ballard followed this route to a shocking destination, a work which contrived a disturbing pile-up between sexual arousal and crumpled bodywork. Three vehicles were approaching. The third, carrying a young woman doctor and her husband, I struck head-on. The man was killed instantly. Seated like a demented Madonna between the doors of the second ambulance, his wife gazed vacantly at the evening traffic. The wound in her right cheek was slowly deforming her face as the bruised tissues gorged themselves on their own blood. I stared at the contours of her thighs. Across them, the gray blanket formed a graceful dune. Somewhere beneath this mound lay the treasure of her pubis. Its precise jut and rake, the untouched sexuality of this intelligent woman presided over the tragic events of the I don't think I could ever have written a novel like Crash, except in the particular circumstances that I was in. I mean, I occasionally have glanced back at, uh, at Crash, and I, you know, I, I, my first reaction as the man who wrote this is, is mad, you know, and then I realize I'm the man who wrote this. I mean, it was a sort of piece of willed insanity. And I think, in a way, I was trying to sort of make sense of, of my wife's death. So I wrote, you know, if you look at the Atrocity Exhibition, these are 
books that attempt to prove that black is white, you know, that two and two do make five by some sort of logic, and that therefore, in a way, everything is all right. The world makes sense. Um, I set my fiction in what I think of as a kind of, I don't want to sound pretentious, but a sort of visionary present, recognizably the same world we, we live in every day, but you know, sharpened and heightened, as if you were on some drug. You know, if you like the present five five minutes ahead. The novel you're writing at the moment. Am I right in thinking it's about terrorism? Yes, it is. No, not, not the September the 11th kind, um, but yes, urban terror, sort of underlying psychology. I don't think it's a good thing, by the way. Um, <laughs> Have you been accused of thinking it's a good no, thing? No, but I can just see it. You know, this is the guy who loved car crashes. But what about the reaction to it? I thought one of the interesting things about that event was that you know, it wasn't entirely divorced from Crash. It wasn't entirely divorced from the sense of um, a fascination with mass damage and what that could do to me. I was as shocked as anybody. Um, but what was strange was the way in which the whole event was sort of, seemed to be conjured out of the American kind of popular imagination, you know, straight out of you know, Schwarzenegger movies and American comic books. They're full of you know, planes crashing into skyscrapers and all that. Ballard has always been fascinated by connections between real worlds and imaginary ones, and where they don't exist, he creates them. His 1979 novel, The Unlimited Dream Company, tells the story of a different kind of hijacker a man who steals a plane and crashes it into Ballard's own backyard, Shepperton. Forgetting to raise the flaps, I was unable to climb higher than 500 feet, but the idea of low-flying aircraft had always excited me. About five miles south of the airport, the engine began to overheat. Within seconds, it caught fire and filled the burning smoke. Below me was a placid riverside town, its tree-lined suburban street and shopping centre tucked into a wide bend of the river. The control column struck itself from my hands. At the last moment, I shouted at the river as it rose towards me. I now know that these quiet tree-lined roads are runways. Waiting for us all to take off for those skies I sought seven days ago, when I flew my aircraft above this small town into which I plunged and where I escaped both my death and my life. Flight has always exerted a magnetic attraction for Ballard. When he suggests lunch, it's at a favourite location, the Hilton Hotel, just yards from the runway at Heathrow. So you can, you can walk straight from the Hilton into the terminal, can you? Just about. I've never actually stayed in this yeah. hotel. I always like it. <laughs> This really does look like a multi-storey car park, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's the idea. Yeah. Another aspect of your early life that fed into your books um, was, was being a pilot. You went off to, to learn to be a pilot in the Air Force. Um, why, is, why was flight kind of important to you then, and why is it such an important element in the books? It may be a generational thing, but I've always admired those lone flyers of the 1920s and 30s, you know, who took off in tiny aircraft made of not much more than string and glue with you know, lawnmower engines, and managed somehow to fly the Atlantic or enormous distances across Africa. Um, I mean, flight is obviously transcendent. It's, a, it's also an escape. Runways have always had a special magic for me. I, I like living near Heathrow. This hotel, uh, close to Terminal 4, is almost my spiritual home. I'm, all, I, I'm never happier than when inside this extraordinary atrium. 
surrounded by, you know, resting air crew. There's something about it that sounds as a symbol of self-transcendent. How abnormal was your, as it were, the normality of Shanghai? I mean, even before war came? It very, it's difficult to convey to people what it's like to live in a city where, you know, if you faint from hunger and fall to the pavements, no one will come and rescue you, where you will literally lie and die, you know, by the passers-by. Shanghai was a brutally cruel place. Civil war had been raging for years around Shanghai. From 37 onwards, the Japanese were there. Um, and were you exposed to that as a child or insulated from it? No, I, we were all exposed to it. I mean, in, in 1937, when the Japanese invaded China, they seized the whole of Shanghai except for the international settlement. My parents and their friends would drive out in their chauffeur-driven American cars to inspect the battlegrounds. Today, a family might go and sort of to the local garden center or to some historic site. Um, we visited these battlegrounds. You know. And did you find it exciting as a child? Lying in... No, I found it strangely almost strangely meaningless. World War II confirmed sort of the whole of reality was a kind of stage set that could be cleared away at a moment's notice. And that, I, I mean, I, I do tend to write a fiction of extreme situations, you know, there's no point in denying that. But then life on this planet for the most part, is fairly extreme. I mean, many people reading, say, Empire of the Sun have said, you know, what an extraordinary life you've had, how unusual. And I always replied, you know, what the life I led during the Second World War was not untypical at all. In fact, it was completely typical of the way most people on this planet have lived during the 20th century and in previous centuries. What is the untypical corner of the planet has been the sort of secure suburbia of England, Western Europe and the United States. Ballard wouldn't be Ballard, of course, if he left that security untroubled. In his fiction, the safe places of the world become more dangerous. In 1974, he even gave an arterial junction a dark spin. In his novel, The Concrete Island, a man crashes off the road and finds himself marooned in a sea of cars, a Robinson Crusoe for the commuter age. Shielding his eyes from the sunlight, Maitland saw that he'd crashed into a small traffic island, some 200 yards long and triangular in shape, that lay in the waste ground between three converging motorway routes. The apex of the island pointed towards the west and the declining sun. A horn blared warningly behind him as he climbed around the trestles. A car plunged within inches of his right hip, an angry passenger whirling in the window. He was still there as dusk began to fall. Headlamps swerved past him, their beams cutting across his face. Horns bled endlessly as the three lines of vehicles, taillights flaring, moved towards the junction. The rush hour was in full swing. He was well aware that no one would stop for him, at least until the rush hour was over at eight o'clock. Then, with luck, he might be able to attract the attention of a solitary driver. A lot of my fiction as an attempt to sort of strip human beings down to their sort of basic elements, to test them to destruction in a way, to see if they can survive. And that probably goes back to my childhood. But I've also got, a, I think, a scientist's eye. I like to invent extreme situations and then devise some sort of extreme solution. I followed my own obsessions when I wrote my early disaster novels, then when I moved on to 
novels about what I see as the modern urban disaster, crack, high rise, concrete island. Latterly, when I've started writing about business parks, and gated communities, I've followed, you know, ideas that have gripped my imagination. One of the novels that foreshadowed Ballard's current preoccupation with enclave communities was the 1975 book High Rise. It described a luxury Docklands apartment block whose prosperous and educated tenants slowly regress to a state of savagery. On the surface, the apartment building remained quiet, but the residents' rebellion against the high rise was now in full swing. Garbage lay heaped around the jammed disposal chutes. The stairways were littered with broken glass, splintered kitchen chairs, and sections of handrail. Even more significant, the payphones in the elevator lobbies had been ripped out, as if the tenants had agreed to shut off any contact with the world outside. Lang knew that he was far happier now than ever before, despite all the hazards of his life. The likelihood that he would die at any time from hunger or assault. He was satisfied with his self-reliance, his ability to cope with the task of survival, foraging, keeping his wits about him, perversities created by the limitless possibilities of the high-rise. You wrote in High Rise about the character who inhabits this, what's supposed to be an ideal kind of building, you know, a high-rise building with all the services, slowly decays into anarchy and brutality. And you write about the, one of the central characters and that only in the darkness could one become sufficiently obsessive, deliberately play on all one's repressed instincts. And he welcomed this forced conscription of the deviant strains in his character. Is that a portrait of the author, in a way? Yes, it strikes me as being, you know, remarkably, uh, remarkably accurate. To be a novelist is a very strange undertaking, really. I mean, if you think of the novels of William Burroughs and Genet and Marquis de Sade, um, which I suppose are precursors of Crash in some kind of way, there's room for the terrorist novel, and I've always thought of myself as sort of, you know, throwing a literary bomb into a rather smug, you know, cafeteria. I, I think most people have a sort of conventionalized view of the world, and I'm interested in sort of stripping away those conventions because the underlying sort of psychological truth is, is, is there to be exposed. I mean, we aren't the rational, sane and sensible people we assume we are. Um, if that were true, there would be no crime. There would be no September the 11th in New York. In fact, we're very far from being sane and rational people. We're a violent people, barely you know, kept under control, and all this needs to be brought out into the open. At the time he'd been sitting in his wheelchair in the centre of the solarium, bathing in the warm artificial light that flowed through the ceiling vents, and watching the shower scene from Psycho on the master screen. He had played the sequence to himself hundreds of times, separately recording sections of the action and displayed them on the smaller screens around the master display. After 12 years of living entirely on his own, he preferred the secure realities of the television screens to the endless bizarre fictions of ordinary life. The Solarium was a fully equipped TV studio in which Pangborn was the star, scriptwriter and director of a domestic serial of infinitely more interest than the programs provided by the public channels. The news bulletins were now about his own body processes, the night's heart rate, and the rising and falling curves of his temperature. We know almost nothing about our bodies. The most vital parts, the brain and the heart and other organs are hidden from view. Um, we're not certain about the workings of our own emotions, 
dreams and ambitions, what their roots are, and our, you know, the whole nature of our personalities is a bit of a mystery to us. So exposing part of that mystery is a great education. And you did study anatomy for a while, didn't you? When yes. you you stopped your medical career halfway through, so as it were, you you learnt the bit where you flay the body, strip it back. You didn't learn the bit where you cure and put the body back together again. Is that is it fair to see some reflection of how your novels are mostly they anatomise society, but they're not setting out to cure them or? I suppose that's true to some extent. In most of my novels, the central character is on a quest for meaning and for self-fulfillment, whatever form that may take. And generally speaking, I mean, my characters do accept a sort of topsy-turvy logic about the world. And I think my novels are, on the whole, rather positive. Ballard's idea of the positive isn't a new ones, though. In his most recent novel, Super Can, he looked again at the symptoms of civilization, the technology parks and the gated communities, which seem to offer complete security. And, typically of Ballard, he detected evidence of moral disease. What these places need, he seems to suggest in the book, is not more security, but more violence. You like places like this. I mean, do you kind of? Is it yes, I do. I do like them. I think they're socially unstructured. There are no hierarchies here. In Supercan, you said that this thing that the, the the Pol Pots and the Hitlers are not going to walk out of the desert. They're going to come out of the shopping malls and and the industrial parks. I mean, do you think you got that wrong? No, I think I've got it right. Um, well, the desert of business park, not the, not the literal desert. I mean, you know, these middle-class educated young men who crash their planes into, uh, you know, into the World Trade Towers came out of a world of, you know, shopping malls and the high-tech environment of those very prosperous Middle Eastern states. The equivalents of the desert today are these vast shopping malls and these business which allow the messianic imagination to begin to fester and digest itself. And then out of this, this sort of world, you know, they arrive on the doorstep of tomorrow and begin to proclaim their new message. Do you think they breed neurosis or they breed danger because they're dull places? These? I don't think business parks and shopping malls are dull. I think they're neutral. That's very important. They're not, I mean, the old fashioned sort of hierarchies that preside over, you know, sort of places like the inns of court in central London or the old universities are very hierarchical. I mean, history is embedded in every stone. Um, these business parks are completely new. They're clearly looking at them, driving around them. They usher in a new kind of high-tech world of where the individual is sort of finessed, you know, out of existence. Intimacy and neighborliness were not features of everyday life at Eden Olympia. An invisible infrastructure took the place of traditional civic virtues. At Eden Olympia, there were no parking problems, no fears of burglars or purse snatchers, no rapes or muggings. The top draw professionals no longer needed to devote a moment's thought to each other and had dispensed with the checks and balances of community life. Representative democracy had been replaced by the surveillance camera and the private police force. Whether we like it or not, the notion of the community as a voluntary association of enlightened citizens has died forever, Penrose explained. We realize how suffocatingly humane we've become, dedicated to moderation in the middle way. The suburbanization of the soul has overrun our planet like a plague. 
there is the notion, which is put forward by one of the characters in the book, that, that violence can be actually morally stimulating, that it can, it can be advantageous. Is that something that you believe? It's a possibility. I mean, the, the, the argument is put forward by the character, a psychiatrist, who I suppose is the villain of the book. Though I think he's quite sympathetic, and I'd agree with him on, on, on a lot of, lot of counts. I mean, it's the sort of argument that, that is easy to make in a, you know, in a, in a safety of one's sort of book line study. But I have a suspicion that some sort of institutionalized violence, which we see in sports, particularly the sort of violent contact sports like boxing, American football, soccer hooliganism, which is a separate sport parallel to soccer, um, are not outlets for violence, but means of provoking it and prompting it because we need to get, we need to get that sort of violence into our systems because they're energizing. They do have a virtue in that they sharpen our moral sense of ourselves. The headlamps flared and everyone was running towards the Avenue St. Nicholas. Burly men in black helmets, like members of a police parachute brigade, leapt from the Range Rover. Club in hand, they set upon the fleeing crowd. Two of them chopped a Volvo dealer to the ground, raining blows on his head and back. Then the leader of the posse led his squad back to the cars. He shouted at the camcorder operator, then spat onto the bloody cobbles at his feet. The violence had been deeply satisfying for Pascal Zander and his senior executives. Entombed all day in their glass palaces, they relished the chance to break the heads of a few pimps and transvestites and impose the rule of the new corporate Puritanism. You could make the point that, in a way, the great dream of the enlightenment of a sane and, and humane society um, where we all respect each other is, in a sense, hopelessly idealistic and doesn't accord with our real nature, that we are a race of partly civilized hunter-killers who've adapted loosely to sort of living in you know, large enclaves. If we're going to be truthful about our real natures and that we are other violent creatures who enjoy violence, it might be necessary to administer small doses of not just violence, psychopathic behavior, very small doses, rather like the very small doses of strychnine in a, in a nerve tonic. They stimulate the system. And can you get them through a book? Yes, I think you can. You get them through, through, through the arts. You get them through operas and tragedy. You get them through novels and, 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 and paintings that charge our emotions. I mean, they, you get them particularly from the sort of, you know, almost the bad boys of the arts, that parallel tradition in the case of writers, writers like William Burroughs, Genet, um, in painting, people like Francis Bacon and Belma. Um, these are people who skirt the edges of violence, pedophilia, you know. Do you think of yourself a as a bad boy of art? No, 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 I'm, I'm deeply moral. Uh, uh, I'm on a one-man safari. I'm a sort of one-man, you know, anthropologist pushing through the through jungle. And, uh, you know, my ears alert for some strange tom-tom. J.G. Ballard doesn't just listen to those disturbing rhythms, he beats them out himself in works that delve beneath the superficial reality of the world. It's difficult to know how best to describe him, as an analyst of our modern neuroses or as our most creative crash investigator, arriving on the scene of the accident before it's even taken place. 
Perhaps in the end, Anatomist gets closer. Other writers show you the world. Ballard gets under its skin. An uncompromising portrayal of emotional meltdown coming up next in a witty adaptation of Ballard's short story, The Enormous Room. I believe in the power of the imagination to remake the world, to hold back the night, to charm motorways, to ingratiate ourselves with birds, to enlist the confidences of madmen. I believe in my own obsessions, in the beauty of the car crash, in the peace of the submerged forest, in the excitements of the deserted holiday beach, in the elegance of automobile graveyards, in the mystery of multi-story car parks in the poetry of abandoned hotels. Over a career spanning 50 years, J.G. Ballard has proved himself to be one of this country's most thought-provoking writers. He enjoyed great mainstream success with Empire of the Sun, which Steven Spielberg later turned into a hit film. But has also caused huge controversy, particularly with Crash, which examined the sexual potential of car crashes and inspired one publisher's reader to write, this author is beyond psychiatric help do not publish. And in the space between these two vastly different novels, Ballard has created a distinctive fictional territory wholly his own. Prophetic, surreal and unsettling, Ballard's 20 novels and hundreds of short stories have together constructed what their author calls a mythology of the future. His body of work is marked by recurrent themes and obsessive symbols, motorways, car parks, high-rises, business parks and abandoned hotels. Ballard's latest novel, Kingdom Come, returns to one of his obsessive themes, the dark forces at work in the suburbs of Middle England. In Claire Holland's South Bank show film, from his lookout in the London suburb of Shepperton, where he's lived for over 40 years, J.G. Ballard talks about his vision of what he calls the only alien planet, Earth, and tells us why science fiction was the true literature of the 20th century. I was living in London and looking for somewhere to live with my wife and children. And the, the sort of London suburbs were a sort of vast, mysterious plain of bricky gables and dual carriageways. The one place that I spotted where well, there was a little house that was for sale was Shepton, and I had a, a vague feeling the film studios, yes, the Malibu of the Thames Valley. <laughs> And I thought, well, you know, there's a dimension of possibility there. Melvin, pleasure yes. to meet you. Very good to meet you. You look well. It's it's incredible. Good to see you first. Yeah. In your favourite aircraft. Here. I like it. It's great. <laughs> I could rent it. I'd happily move in. <laughs> oh. So if we uh, get to the market, we'll get moving on. You were brought up, as it were, in Shanghai. Many people watching this will know the film Empire of the Sun if they haven't read the book or know both. But from, in your terms, can you give us some idea of what you f now feel, looking back, it was like to be brought up in Shanghai? My parents were both English. My, my father and mother went out there in 1929. I was born there in 1930. I have very strong memories of this exciting, in some ways frightening city where, as a child of one of the Western powers who ran the city, I had a sort of passport to safety at all times. I mean, I used to do, get on my bike at the age of seven or eight and pedal off through downtown Shanghai in all that sort of nightmare traffic. And this was a city plagued by terrorist bombs and bitter fighting between rival Chinese power groups. Then in 1937, the Japanese invaded China. Shanghai is doomed. 
Panic seizes the population. Fear drives thousands in a desperate move to the safety of the international settlement. War was all around us. Shells were passing over our house. So we moved to the French concession for about six months. Looking back, I think I saw it as part of a sort of film, almost. The kind of films that I saw, even as a very small boy, in the Shanghai theatres, had sort of leaked out into reality and were taking place at the end of my own street. But one thing that intrigues me about what you've said there is this extraordinary charmed life you had, Jim. You were this, this English boy. You got on your bike, your English bike, and cycled through these very dangerous parts, and people left you alone. I don't think my parents were aware of what I was doing. I once asked my mother, when she was a very old woman, sort of, you know, I used to ride my bicycle around Shanghai. She said, we didn't know. I think the reason was that the retaliation from the Shanghai police force, which was run by the British, would have been swift and brutal. So you tended to be left alone. All that changed very dramatically after Pearl Harbor when Japan attacked America and Britain. And I suddenly noticed that nobody was treating me with any respect at all. Uh, it was get out of the way. Almost 40 years later, when you, you, you went back to the imprint of those times uh, to write Empire of the Sun, which became an extremely successful book, an extremely successful film, had you been wanting to write it during those 40 years? I think when I came to England in 1946, I soon realised that I was going to spend the rest of my life here if, effectively. So I thought, there's no point in trying to remember Shanghai and my life there. It's gone. Forget it. The trouble was that Shanghai kept coming back. Bodies of Chinese lay everywhere, hands tied behind their backs in the centre of the road, dumped behind the sandbag emplacements, half-severed heads resting on each other's shoulders. The thousands of young gangsters in their American suits had gone, but at the Bubbling Well Road checkpoint, Jim saw one youth in a blue silk suit being beaten by two soldiers with staves. As the blows struck his head, he knelt in a pool of blood that dripped from his lapels. Empire of the Sun, published in 1984, presents a fictionalised account of Ballard's childhood in occupied Shanghai, revisiting the unsettling and distinctive landscapes which define his fiction. Did you deliberately omit certain things to make it dramatically more effective, or did it just evolve the way it did without you making those sort of conscious decisions? No, I had to, I had to leave a lot of things out. It was impossible to compress four to five years um, of life, particularly when so much was happening. Most of the novel is set in the Japanese camp where I was interned with my parents. The biggest change I made was to leave my parents out. I made the boy, my younger self in effect, Jim, a kind of war orphan. I had him separated from his parents. A certain sort of estrangement took place during the camp years between me and my parents. And, you know, they couldn't feed me, close me, protect me. I've got some, I've got some. Also, I saw them shaken and rattled by the war. For a child these days to see its parents frightened is very rare. And when you've seen your parents sort of lose their authority, it's something they never regain, I think. So leaving them out was, was truer psychologically to my actual experiences. His childhood and, and adolescence was marked by this absolutely profound dislocation of, of reality. You look at something like the killing of the young Chinese man by the four Japanese soldiers on the abandoned railway station where the, where the, the man is, is asphyxiated by a telephone wire in front of his face, you know, get a quintessential and horrific ballard image. But, I mean, this really happened to him.
He really was that boy. He really did see that happen. Human beings are extremely cruel and combative. I think my life in Shanghai in the 30s and 40s was much closer to the reality of this world than, say, living in the cosy suburbs of the west of London. I don't feel that um, Shanghai was such a bad preparation for, you know, for living in our time. When you came here, you decided to um, study medicine. What made you go in that direction? I think I thought, if I become a psychiatrist, my first patient will be me. I will find out what's wrong. I'm not sure there was anything wrong, but I just carried too much of a burden from the past. To become a psychiatrist then, you know, in 1950, you needed a medical degree. And I thoroughly enjoyed the two years I spent as a medical student, particularly the anatomy, dissecting cadavers. You spend hours each day minutely tearing away the skin and muscles and nerves, ex carrying out this extremely detailed examination of, an, of, of what was once a human being with a heart, with love affairs, triumphs, disappointments. By the time you've completed the dissection of the head in particular, you have explored a great Amazon of sort of of human possibilities and human experience. It was a marvellous education. I think everyone should, should study medicine, should study anatomy anyway. Why did you drop out of medicine and join the RAF? I was already writing short stories and, you know, I sort of told myself I was already a novelist. I, I'd written sort of 20 pages, and when you're a novice, as you know, when you're first setting out, the 20 pages of a novel, when you're 19, um, Seems like, you know, seems like Finnegan's wake. So I thought, I'll take my chances. Then I, I, I had a number of jobs. Then I thought, I'll try flying. So I spent about a year in the RAF, or the Royal Canadian Air Force, actually. But I still had to make another break and um, embark on, a, on what, what, you know, was quite a difficult set of obstacles to cross, becoming a published writer, not easy. How and why did you decide to, um, to write science fiction? What England needed, I felt, in the mid-50s, desperately, was change. It seemed so stuck in its ways. Its social conventions and its class system were all set in concrete. And when I discovered, by chance, science fiction, I thought, here's a a literature which has terrific vitality and is about change. I wasn't interested in spaceships and time travel. I thought, this is a medium where I can put to use my interest in social change. You know, the American way of life, the consumer society, television, which was going to dominate everything. First jet travel, motorways. I mean, we take them for granted now, but motorways provoked all sorts of worried letters to the Times newspaper when the M1 was opened. Are we going to Americanize our country? Do we want a deracinated people endlessly driving their cars up and down the land? And I thought, what? Uh, you know, this is a motorway, for heaven's sake. It was important to to write about change, and science fiction was a very good way. Also, I had a flair for it. You could write an unlimited number of short stories. You could write 10 a month and get them published if you wrote that many. That was quite something. It's a genre for swats, really, science fiction. Um, it's a nerdy genre, and he isn't at all like that. He, ha he has a sort of a grandness that you don't often find in, in this sort of chemistry lab kind of mind that the lesser writers are, are like that. But I wouldn't be as embarrassed as some people are by the label science fiction. I think it's produced many works of, of great genius. Um, but nor, nor would I dream of confining him to that genre either. Since the introduction of the 24-hour spending day, the shopping complex was never closed. 
the bulk of the shoppers were discount buyers, housewives contracted to make huge volume purchases of food, clothing and appliances against substantial overall price cuts, and forced to drive around all day from supermarket to supermarket, frantically trying to keep pace with their purchase schedules and grappling with the added incentives inserted to keep the schemes alive. What he correctly identified was the point in which uh, humankind quite rightly began to lose its faith in the scientific notion that technology was going to deliver us from universal want and need and bring a bright new shiny future of, of jetpacks and, and dinner and a pill. He kind of spotted that very early on uh, and I think his work therefore uh, you know, it was part of what, what made it possible to redefine science fiction as a genre, but, but arguably redefine it out of being science fiction. You also are firmly of the opinion that uh, science fiction is the true and best way to write about the situation in which we find ourselves. I thought science fiction was, was the literature of the 20th century. I think science fiction has played back the 20th century to itself in a way that the mainstream novel doesn't. If you think of the Hampstead novel, it describes a very small social class engaged in sort of very small sort of location dances of bees are about as expressive as the most ham you know, Hampstead novels. And the great thing about science fiction was that nobody lives in Hampstead. I believe in the genital organs of great men and women, in the postures of President Kennedy, Margaret Thatcher, and Princess Di, and the sweet odors emanating from their lips as they regard the cameras of the world. I believe in madness, in the truth of the inexplicable, in the common sense of stones, in the lunacy of flowers. I believe in nothing. Your first novel, The Drowned World, 1962, that imagined a future where there's been a great uh, ecological catastrophe, polar ice caps melting. Uh, this is way before everybody worried about polar ice caps melting and so on. Did you write The Drowned World to a prescription? What if this would happen? Had you intimations of melting polar ice caps? I was very under the influence of the surrealists at that time. I think that's partly because war produces very surrealist effects. The bus on top of a block of flats after a bombing raid or five-story building collapses and we can see all the individual homes with their furniture still in place. Strange effects like that. I love the paintings of Max Ernst, deep jungles, which seem like the unconscious mind exposed to daylight or to this strange half-light that you find in surrealist paintings. They seem to be painting states of mind, which I was interested in doing, because The Drowned World is also an attempt to sort of plunge down into the spinal column and descend into a more primeval world where we'll find our true selves, perhaps. One of the themes of um, surrealist painting was a sort of sense of ecological disaster or ecological dread. You think of temperatures where clocks melt and these kind of petrified forests. It looks as though it could have been a cover from one of his early books. The early stories were all kind of full of the same sense of ecological dread and disaster, kind of drowned worlds, vermilion sands, crystal world. Um, the kind of post-apocalyptic landscape that was very much a feature of the atomic age. In the early morning light, a strange, mournful beauty hung over the lagoon. The sombre green-black fronds of the gymnosperms, intruders from the Triassic past and the half-submerged, white-faced buildings of the 20th century still reflected together in the dark mirror of the water. The two interlocking worlds apparently suspended at some junction in time. So you're talking about mindscapes as well as landscapes, aren't you? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, these are novels of catastrophe, the early ones, of natural catastrophes, polar ice caps melting and so on. But then I started looking at what I think of as sort of urban catastrophe. And I started because by the end of the 60s, a lot of the kind of social contradictions that weren't so evident 
when we were all enjoying swinging London, those of us who could find a babysitter, um, a lot of the contradictions were coming out into the open. And I thought, you know, there was a kind of culture of sensation that I think was ignited by the Kennedy assassination and the way that was endlessly replayed on television. I thought, this is strange, because everything, there's a sort of devaluation of, of human sympathy going on here. We're sort of brutalizing ourselves in this endless quest for, you know, for excitement and sensation. Another massive effect on your life, which we needn't talk about but just record, is that your wife died very suddenly, uh, leaving you with three children to bring up, which you did. That must have had a tremendous effect on your life. Yes, it did. I mean, it absolutely shattered me. Uh, I think it probably changed everything about me, to be honest. I think I, I was never the same person again. You know, my wife was 34 when she died of pneumonia while we were on holiday in Spain leaving these three small children. I felt, you know, that nature had committed a terrible crime against this young woman. It took me a long while to, to accommodate that into some sort of, you know... I started writing a series of strange short fictions that were collected as the Atrocity Exhibition. It was very unusual at the time for someone to publish a book containing two short stories, one called The Facelift of Princess Margaret, and the other called Why, Why I Want to Fuck Ronald Reagan. Um, you know, that would be unusual at any time, perhaps. The central character is a, a psychiatrist who's having a mental breakdown. He's obsessed with the amount of cruelty and pure sensation for its own sake that floods the world, floods TV screens and films and so on. He sets out on a, on a sort of strange little odyssey of his own in which he restages some of the most terrible events of his time, the Kennedy assassination, for example. Oswald was the starter. From his window above the track, he opened the race by firing the starting gun. It is believed that the first shot was not properly heard by all the drivers. In the following confusion, Oswald fired the gun two more times, but the race was already underway. Kennedy got off to a bad start. There was a governor in his car, and its speed remained constant at about 15 miles an hour. However, shortly afterwards, when the governor had been put out of action, the car accelerated rapidly and continued at high speed along the remainder of the course. I think it was all an attempt to make, you know, two and two make five. And if two and two could make five, then somehow my wife's death could be explained. It couldn't. I'd seen enough during my childhood to know death comes without any sort of calling card, just comes suddenly. And it's probably meaningless. But it takes a long time to learn that. Can you tell us about the form of that book? You could call it experimental, but some people might say that all it proves is that the experiment hasn't worked. <laughs> the problem is that people tackle the book as if it was a conventional sort of linear narrative running page one onwards, and it isn't. I wanted something that reflected the texture of everyday life in the 60s. There was this sense that we were living entirely in a media landscape. It was very difficult to tell what was real and what was false. And I wanted to convey something of the, of the feeling of what it was like to be bombarded from all sides. And particularly if you were having a nervous breakdown, you might well see the world as, as it's shown in the, in the atrocity exhibition. The thing to do is don't start reading page one and, and start at random, anywhere. If you find a paragraph that intrigues you, read it. It'll probably set up resonances in your mind. Move on and look at the adjacent paragraphs. Soon, it will begin to assemble a portrait of something probably close to everyday reality. Crash made its appearance in the Trusty Exhibition. Three years later, you wrote what still could be thought of as your most controversial novel, Crash. Um, and I'm going to... I can't resist quoting one publisher's reader who said, this author whose 
is beyond psychiatric help, do not publish. Well, it was published, and it's republished and republished and republished. Can you tell us what you were doing in that and the, the way that the technology and the idea of the eroticism of the car crash drove through the book in a, in, in a way that disturbed people? Do not publish, said this chap. I took that, by the way, as a huge compliment. I, you know, because the, the, this publisher's reader was her, herself the wife of a psychiatrist. And uh, I thought, ah, you know, total artistic success. Um, I think I was obsessed then with the sort of the taste for cruelty and sensation that we saw, you know, particularly in the cinema. Feature films were unbelievably violent then, and at the center of most feature films was the car chase and like a sort of evil flower emerging out of the sort of screaming streets came this, you know, the crashing cars. And nobody, no one seemed in the least put off by the car crash. Ram the rockets! It's obvious that the car crash has powerful resonances that, particularly if they involve the death of the famous, that, you know, plane crashes or hotel fires or train crashes don't have. What, what, it, what is it about the car? Yes. Well, I think it's that, of course, we all drive, most of us drive cars. Most of us are aware that if we give in to feelings of aggression, we may kill ourselves. There's a sort of erotic fascination that death has for us when we imagine it. I mean, the, the connections between sex, eroticism, and death have been explored, you know, for hundreds of years, if not thousands. But it seemed to me that what had once been a sort of morbid playground of a small group of you know, French intellectuals was was the standard fare chosen by mass audiences who were going to the movies for the evening. They quite liked it, you know, watching people entangled in car crashes. So I thought, there's probably, you know, there's some sort of connection that needs to be explored. Vaughan unfolded for me all his obsessions with the mysterious eroticism of wounds the perverse logic of blood-soaked instrument panels, seat belts smeared with excrement, sun visors lined with brain tissue. For Vaughan, each crashed car set off a tremor of excitement. In the complex geometries of a dented fender, in the unexpected variations of crushed radiator grills, in the grotesque overhang of an instrument panel forced onto a driver's crotch as if in some calibrated act of machine fellatio. I wrote sarcastically about crash as a, as a defense uh, because I didn't get it and it alarmed me and everyone did too. I mean it got, everyone wore a different costume to the ball. I wore sarcasm, a lot of people wore moral outrage, etc. Um, I didn't get it. I wanted people to be shocked and disgusted. I wanted to unsettle the reader. I wanted to expose the perverse side of the reader's mind. And I wanted to provoke the reader into facing the possibility that people are excited by violence.
The interesting thing is that 20, 23 years later, when David Cronenberg turned into a film, it was equally uh, controversial. Alexander Walker, then the uh, movie critic of the Evening Standard, said, a movie beyond the bounds of depravity, and it was banned by Westminster City Council. Still uh, is. Still, so you'd hit something that the nerve hadn't been uh, anaesthetised, had it? I went to Cannes with the, when it was shown there, taking the line that this film was a sort of deeply moral statement. At this point, Walker stood up and stormed out. But I noticed that the French and Italians, the Spaniards who were there, all completely understood what Crash was about. The distinction is between the, sort of the Catholic countries, which believe in original sin, know we're all rather perverse if we're given half a chance. Um, and, we and they have a death at the centre of their religion. Right. And, say, the Protestant countries of Northern Europe, the film was banned in Norway. It was banned in large sections of this country, in effect, and banned in large sections of, of America. I think we are still deeply repressed, and we don't, there are things we don't like to acknowledge about ourselves. What I didn't get is that the obsessive love of the car crash is a result of a car crash. Um, the main character, who's called Ballard, has just had a car crash in which someone else, not himself, has died. And he's in a state of shock, and that's what the novel miraculously conveys. I, I, realize having read it for the third or fourth time, um, which I did when writing about the Cronenberg film, where I recanted and um, came round and uh, at last saw what he was trying to do. Ballard is a highly moral writer who is so moral that he can entertain within the confines of the text total amorality. For Ballard, it's a kind of high wire of ambiguity. The reader can never really tell what's going on here. Are they being told not to drive too fast, or are they being told that, that they really should drive into the next available concrete stanchion and then masturbate in, uh, over the, the smashed instrument binnacle? I mean, and, and you know what? You're never going to know. I've often said about my fiction as a whole that, you know, I'm not a pessimist, a man who holds a sign up saying, you know, dangerous bends ahead, slow down, is not a pessimist. On the other hand, I sometimes tend to hold up a sign saying dangerous bends ahead, speed up, because I've got a slightly perverse delight in provoking people, you know, just a little too far. I believe in anxiety, psychosis, and despair. I believe in the perversions, in the infatuations with trees, princesses, prime ministers, derelict filling stations, more beautiful than the Taj Mahal, clouds and birds. I believe in the death of the emotions and the triumph of the imagination. In your fiction, what it seems to me that you're saying is that we used to think, when we said the real world, we used to think it was out there. That was the real world, of people out there doing this, that, and the other. You're now proposing that it's become a fictional world out there, and the reality is now the responsibility of the imagination. Yes, I mean, I think that to my father's generation, you know, in the 1910s and 1920s, the real world was the world of work, of offices, factories, and the like, and the world of the imagination existed inside one's own head, one's dreams, fears, ambitions. That is now almost reversed. Reality is now a mass of competing fictions. We walk down streets which are lined with advertisements trying to sell us some fairy tale, such as that this particular detergent will wash your children's clothes to the point where their friends, mothers, will envy them. Now, that's a piece of fiction. By the same token, the one area that we can rely on for some sort of truth is the, you know, is the, is the space inside our heads. In some of your novels, you've almost created laboratories in which to test this theory. One of these is a novel called Supercan, 
It's set on the Riviera, which you know very well. It can be called a detective novel. It can be called an investigative novel. It can be called a dystopian novel. Or, but what, we, what do you think you were setting out to do? I've been going to the French Riviera, really, since the late 40s, on holiday. A man. It's changed from a playground into a sort of work ground. If you go into the big hotels in Cannes or Nice, you find you know, the people in the lift with you are brain surgeons attending a conference, Volvo salesmen attending you know, some big get-together. The whole infrastructure of the place has changed. There are motorways, heliports, science parks that have sprung up. And one of the largest, the Sophia Antipolis, it's a huge science park where people live in the residential enclaves within the science park. People there have an odd look in their eyes. It's unmistakable. That's the sort of look you, you see in the eyes of people on the other side of, who are looking at you through barbed wire, watchful, dulled, sort of anaesthetized. And I thought, what will happen to these people if they stay too long here? Something might be needed to spark these people and give them a sense of achievement and excitement in their lives. And I visualize in Supercan a society of utterly exhausted senior executives who only get their joie de vivre by joining little groups who go out at night and attack immigrant families. And the psychiatrist who runs this therapeutic scheme defends it by saying, you know, this is the future. I realized that these highly disciplined professionals had very strange dreams, fantasies filled with suppressed yearnings for violence and ugly narratives of anger and revenge, like the starvation dreams of death camp prisoners. Despair was screaming through the bars of the corporate cage, the hunger of men and women exiled from their deeper selves. They wanted more violence in their lives. We're falling back on our oldest resource, which is on our own psychopathology. It's the one thing that will energize us. T.S. Eliot famously said, humankind cannot bear too much reality. In a sense, what you're saying in Supercan is humankind cannot bear too much unreality. It's what could be described as an isolated, privileged, perfect, in inverted commas, community. But you extend the metaphor massively. You use the area in which we are now, Shepparton, uh, in your new book, Kingdom Come. Uh, you use that as a location which is clearly standing for where everybody's going. Somewhere you say, everywhere is becoming a suburb of, of Dusseldorf. This book addresses, attacks, attempts to understand, says some things which will uh, surprise a lot of people in praise of the consumer society. This is where freedom is, this is where the real life is. Can you just disentangle some of the themes in Kingdom Come? It's set in the West London suburbs, not far from the M25. It's an area that most inner Londoners are unaware of, never visit, pass by in polite horror as they return from their West Country cottages and speed gratefully off the M25 towards what I call heritage London. To them, the sort of area in which I set my novel, Brooklands, is an uncentered area where there are no civic values, where people are only interested in new patio doors, a new timeshare in the Algarve, another car. The sort of pillars that held society together, the monarchy, the Church of England, politics, They've all lost their authority, I think. So what is left, all that is left, is consumerism, the consumer society of buy, buy, buy. He's lived for many years in, in Shepparton, which he, he thinks of as being on the edge of the future. And he sees the future as being one of these endless lists of retail parks, marinas, 
and above all the, the grand new project which is the mega shopping center which is the kind of Kubla Khan Xanadu of his fiction. It is a kind of ecclesiastical space of consumerism. We're facing a new kind of man and woman, narrow-eyed, passive, clutching their store cards. They believe anything that people like you care to tell them. They want to be tricked, they want to be deluded into buying the latest rubbish. They've been educated by TV commercials. They know that the only things with any value are those they can put in a carrier bag. This is a plague area, Mr. Pearson, a plague called consumerism. You take the idea of the domination of consumerism and you drive this through to a state of um, middle-class barbarism, uh, rebellion, attempted republicanism, crowds going around wearing the St. George cross on their shirts, following different teams in different ways and behaving violently. Is this a prophetic vision? Do you think, could, could, would you describe it as that? Yes, I think it is a vision of what might happen. Um, I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I think there are tendencies in that direction during the World Cup, looking at all those St. George's flags flying. A series of football matches are summoning up the kind of national energies and conviction that you only get at the time of a world war. There's something, something going on which suggests that people are hungry for a more disciplined society. I mean, shopping is quite a disciplined activity. There's something of the political rally, Nazi style, about, you know, about a big shopping mall, lines of neatly aligned counters, the slogans, the expectations, the sense of, you know, these are ceremonies of mass affirmation, where we, society, affirm in what we believe, and we believe that so-and-so washes whiter. I think there's a danger that consumerism, to keep going, may need something more violent and dramatic. You know, it's like what William Burroughs said about heroin. You know, heroin is, 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 is the only product, uh, you know, which you sell people to rather than selling it to people. And I, I think that that's what Ballard believes has happened with consumerism. But as ever with Ballard, this is not to be taken as a necessarily a negative statement. You know, it's got its upside. It has its own strange potentials. What Ballard sees as the future is boredom reaching the point where it has to be rescued by terror. It's, it's a voyage into madness. This book seems to be preaching insanity. I mean, he's saying that essentially we've, we've gone insane, but where we've gone insane in a way that leaves us as a, as a tranquilized robotic state. Let's break through that. Let's start assassinating. Let's re-enact the Kennedy assassinations in shopping centers. In Kingdom Come, the, uh, the main protagonist changes from being someone with whom one's so sympathetic, he goes to find out how his father was shot and killed in this great mall. But then he actually begins to manipulate it. And he turns it into a semi-fascist state. And we don't quite know what to make of what he's doing there. It's very interestingly confusing at that point. Various people in the book, various characters, say, fascist? Where are the ranting Führers? The reply from, from a psychiatrist who's concerned about all this is, you know, we don't need a ranting Führer. Our Führers will be afternoon TV cable channel hosts much milder and a sort of fascism light. But it, will, it draws on the same impulses. But in Kingdom Come, as in several of your other books you've talked about, the resolution and the solution seems to be a mixture of erotic violence. Well, you're still with that obsession, aren't you? I'm not sure, you know, England, say, in 2006, is all that sane and happier place. I think at heart, you know, there's a tremendous boredom that people swage by shopping, and there's a, a lack of direction that people believe in nothing. You um, think boredom is dangerous, don't you? Boredom is dangerous, and believing in nothing is very dangerous. We all need to keep our eyes peeled for that man at the roadside with a sign saying dangerous bends ahead. So do you see over 50 years your 
books which have uh, a great inner cohesion, sometimes use the same, the, the same characters, the same names, and so on and so forth. Do you see them in one sense as cautionary tales? Yes, I think, I think they're all cautionary tales uh, in a way. I think they're all extrapolations from, from tendencies that are present. I mean, these are not long-distance prophecies of the, of the kind that Aldous Huxley and Orwell produced in Brave New World and, and 1984. They're short-term prophecies, looking at the next five minutes, in a sense. He's a man who's quite willing to say the unsayable. He, he, he says all the things that are most politically incorrect, most dangerous, most demented. Now, you don't know when you see the planes going into the Twin Towers or you see Diana's car crash, journalists are straight on to Ballard as if he has somehow caused these things by getting into that wavelength so many years before and describing events before they happen. For somebody who believes that the writer's project is to invent reality, I think Ballard has invented the reality that we live in. You cannot say of any other novelist I think in the world, let alone England, that they have been capable of perceiving uh, as kind of congruent entities such phenomena as global warming and environmental disaster generally, the rise of the cult of the celebrity and its implications for mass psychology, the realities of the modern world, of what technology actually did deliver to the world and to England in particular. And, and yes, I would stand by the assertion that he's the most significant post-war English novelist. And to adapt to something you yourself said, do you think you've been faithful to your own obsessions? And if so, what would you say they were? I watched my obsessions develop over, over 50 years as a writer, and I'm very lucky that I've been able to express those obsessions as a writer. I mean, had I decided to be a a, a psychiatrist, I might have been able to do real damage I'm obsessed with a sort of nagging need to find the key to a sort of central mystery, which I've never really identified. And I think it's probably something to do with my life in China. The images of, of Ballard that, that, that stay in the mind are, are all from the internment camp and from Shanghai's post-imperial grandeur left to rot. These symbols of emptiness and decay and so on very much move him and he, he invests them with a great deal of feeling. When Empire of the Sun appeared, for those of us that were already steeped in the fictional oeuvre, it was like encountering this kind of primary map, whereas I suppose for other people who, who weren't equated for his fiction, it was, you know, reading a book about a boy in an internment camp during the war. I believe all excuses, I believe all reasons, I believe all hallucinations, I believe all anger, I believe all mythologies, memories, lies, fantasies, evasions. I believe in the mystery and melancholy of a hand, in the kindness of trees, in the wisdom of light. When I was a child, I found Shanghai complete mystery, the way in which reality could change overnight. That reality was just a stage set that could be swept aside, that all the certainties of my life, all the adult certainties that I looked up at, um, that gave me a sense of security, were in fact paper thin and completely treacherous. Nothing was to be trusted, and I, I felt an obligation to try to, a sort of almost a small boy's need to find out what on earth is going on. You know, peep through the letter, see what the adults are getting up to. And I knew that, you know, you couldn't trust the adults. They didn't really know what they were doing. Um, so it was left to me to sort of have a stab at it. Thank you very much. And that Melvin Bragg interview with J.G. Ballard will be available as a podcast from tomorrow. That's at itv.com slash southbank. <laughs>